In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Dear saints, today we hear out of Jesus' lips the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And yet, the parable you hear today is not the full story. You heard the whole parable, of course. The kingdom of the heavens is like a master of the house, so on and so on. He goes out, he hires the workers, calls them into the vineyard, calls them at the first hour, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, keeps on calling, and at the end of the day, strangely, unexpectedly, they all receive the very same reward, the same pay for different amounts of labor. But this isn't one of those parables which Jesus just tells out of the blue. And often, when you read or hear the scriptures, you must pay attention not just to the words themselves, but sometimes you need to ask yourself, why these words? Why right now? Why this parable? Well, here's the full story. If you back up a chapter, you'll find that a rich young man once came to Jesus and asked him, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? And in the end, he was sent away sad. Jesus told him, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. The demand is steep, it's too much, the man is disheartened. Peter, however, hears something different. Peter's ears perk up. Later, he comes to Jesus and says, look, Lord, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus answers, yes, Peter, you will sit on 12 thrones beside me, and everyone who follows me, whoever loses wealth and land and even family on account of me, they all will receive for their loss a hundredfold. They will even inherit eternal life. Yes, Peter, you will be richly rewarded. But, there's a but. It's not quite so simple. But there's more going on here. That's always how it is with our Lord, if you haven't noticed. His kingdom doesn't work the way we expect. That's why he has to keep on teaching about it. That's why he tells these parables. Peter hangs on Jesus' words. Look, Master, you promised that guy heavenly treasure if he left everything to follow you. Look what we've done. What do we get? What about us? He sees his chance for reward, for blessing, for favor with the Lord. He jumps at it. But our Lord is good in a way that we have a hard time grasping. Yes, he's happy to give blessing and honor and reward to Peter, exactly what he seeks. He's not stingy with the heavenly treasure. He's not concerned that anyone undeserving might take hold of it. In fact, he loves to hand it out to everyone and anyone he can. Yes, Peter, you and all who follow me will receive the heavenly treasure, but, Jesus says, Many who are first will be last, and the last first. Jesus answers Peter's question directly, but he throws this huge asterisk on to the end. The first will be last, the last first. It's a little mystifying, a little mysterious. It would be just like Jesus to just leave a statement like that hanging and leave you to figure it out yourself. But thanks be to God, he gives us a little more this time. The first will be last, the last first for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. That little word for says everything. It says, now let me explain to you what on earth this means. And so this entire parable, its whole teaching about the kingdom is that asterisk on the discussion with Peter about rewards in the kingdom of heaven. It is as if Jesus were to say, yes, indeed, there will be rewards for you all for all your good works, but you need to understand that these rewards don't quite work the way you might think. So let us hear the parable again, dear saints. The kingdom of the heavens is like a man. And the man, it says, is the master of the house, the lord of the vineyard. And naturally, he goes out first thing in the morning to hire some laborers to work for the day in the vineyard. He has no difficulty finding workers. He calls upon them. He makes an agreement with them, come, follow me, work in the vineyard, and I promise in the end to give you the denarius, the reward for your labors. All seems normal. 
Everything is tracking right with Peter's question. The laborers come, they do the work, they get the reward they're owed, everything is fair. But as with all the parables, this isn't going to be an ordinary sort of story. This isn't an ordinary businessman and his employees. Remember, this is a depiction of the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven works a little bit differently. And already you know there's something odd when the master goes out again to hire more workers. Around 9 o'clock he goes out, he hires some more, he promises to pay them whatever is just. And the parable leaves you hanging. Well, what is just? Maybe it's going to be the day's denarius minus a little bit for the time spent idle in the marketplace. Nine hours pay instead of 12. They leave that aside for now. They'll figure that all out at the end of the day. He keeps going out. More workers again and again. He goes out at noon. He goes out at three. He goes out even at five o'clock when the evening is about to fall. And now you know something is not normal here. He keeps going out. He keeps gathering them into his vineyard. At no point is there any thought about how much labor he can afford, how much labor he really needs. He doesn't question the use of hiring these last ones for just an hour of work. Nor does this man have anything better to do, it seems, than spend all day going out and calling more people into his vineyard. We start to get the impression that maybe this isn't a businessman at all. Maybe he's just trying to get as many men as he can into his vineyard before nightfall. Maybe when he went out that morning, it didn't really have to do with how much work he needed done in the vineyard. And maybe the workers are getting more out of this arrangement than he is. Now, dear saints, in Jesus' parables, we're often met with these strange characters. We have the sower who casts his precious seed over rocks and thorns and good soil alike. We have a king who invites to his banquet anyone who can be found, the highways and the hedges, the poor and crippled, the blind and the lame. Or we meet with a steward who dishonestly cancels out the debts owed to his master, and yet he's commended for it. These parables are all set in this world that we know. They deal with common, ordinary, everyday things. But then you find one thing, some piece of the puzzle that doesn't add up. That one character who acts strangely, who doesn't behave the way we would behave, who does something that doesn't seem to fit in our ordinary world. And that's when you know you found something that is not of this world. That's where you're going to see Jesus in the parables. Dollars and cents, profit and debt, a fair pay for a day's work, that's what makes sense to us. But Jesus just doesn't seem to fit in. Forgiveness of sins, rewards undeserved, generosity that takes no thought for return of profit, these are not features of this fallen world. They belong to another kingdom, indeed the kingdom of the heavens. And so that's why Jesus has to teach these parables. So in this parable, it's the master of the house, the master of the vineyard. He goes out over and over. He hires workers he doesn't really even need. He promises to give them what is just, and when the time comes to pay the wages out, what's just just doesn't really make any sense. At the end of the day, the master instructs his manager to pay the last first and the first last, and we finally get to see exactly what it is that is just. Everyone. From the last to the first, without distinction, gets the same reward for their labors, one whole denarius. And now perhaps you're glad to hear how generous and noble this master is, giving the full pay even to those who've hardly done a thing, but let's not pretend it doesn't bother you just a little bit. The complaint is obvious, and if any of you were in their shoes, you would have said the same thing. That's not fair. How is this right? What's just about it? How come they're getting what we worked for? This kind of justice just doesn't make any sense, at least not to us. The master calls himself good, but this goodness seems strange. He's happy to give out wages beyond what's earned. He's not stingy with the money. He's not concerned that anyone undeserving might take hold of it. In fact, he loves to hand it out to anyone he can. That is the goodness and the justice of God. It's a goodness that existed long before men in this sinful world began thinking of their own interest and benefit. 
long before anyone down here began insisting on their own rights and what they are owed. If this goodness seems strange or unfair, then it only looks that way in the midst of a fallen, sinful, selfish people, bent on getting their due and what they think is fair for themselves. God's not interested in that. The only right he demands for himself is the right to hand out the heavenly treasure freely, to give it out to everyone he can, whether it be the eleventh hour or not, whether they've labored through the burden of the day or not. Our Lord is at his most good, at his most just, precisely when he's giving out gifts to those who don't deserve them. And with all the parables, the question is, why? Why would anyone act like this? Why would any master run his vineyard this way? And that's exactly why they're parables of the kingdom. This isn't about capitalism or socialism. It's not about how you should treat one another. It's not about Peter or how much he's worked or sacrificed. It's about Jesus. And it's about what he has done and continues to do for sinners. You see, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is teaching about here is the kingdom which he establishes and rules from the cross. It's founded upon the rivers of mercy and grace which flow forth from his cross, sacrificed for you. Jesus gave up his entire self into death in order to pay the wages you truly deserved for your sins, for your idleness, for your selfishness, for your lust and your grumbling and your self-seeking. And yet out of his death comes a heavenly treasure that indeed you have not labored for. You have not deserved, you have not rightly earned. Instead, it's given to you out of love, out of mercy, out of God's astounding goodness, not because he owes it to you. That's why Jesus tells this parable on this occasion. Peter sees what is promised. He wants to know if he'll get what is just for his labors and his sacrifices. Well, yes, Peter, you've heeded the call. You've labored in the vineyard. You've borne the burden of the day, the scorching heat. You will receive your heavenly treasure, a hundredfold reward, eternal life. But don't think for a minute your labors are why you're going to get it. The Lord gives the treasure not like a man hiring out workers. He doesn't part with it grudgingly just because he needs some work done. With him, it's exactly the opposite. He goes out calling and summoning because he wants everyone in the vineyard. He wants you in the vineyard. He wants to give you his heavenly treasures. He wants you to desire and long for and treasure up the rewards which he promises, but he also wants you to receive them as gifts of his mercy, not wages which you are owed. God is not and cannot be your debtor. Now we hear this parable today on Septuagesima, especially as we come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. We now set our faces toward Jerusalem, towards the cross. Today is Septuagesima. That means it's now less than 70 days until we observe once more the Feast of Feasts, the heart of the Christian life, our Lord's sacred passion and death and resurrection on Holy Week. Today marks then the beginning of this season we call Pre-Lent a chance to prepare, to ready yourselves for the 40 days of Lent. That Lenten fast and season will be a time of repentance, of turning away from evil deeds, turning away from your own selfish mm. desires, striving ever more after good works and virtue. Indeed, you may take up extra disciplines of prayer. We'll be praying more here and offering more opportunities for worship on the Wednesdays in Lent. You may take up an extra practice of almsgiving and giving out of what the Lord has given to you. You may take up disciplines of fasting and exercising and practicing self-control for yourself. And regardless of what discipline you may or may not take up, you certainly ought to labor all the more to show love to your neighbors, to be patient and kind, to do good to those who don't deserve it, to turn the other cheek and be self-controlled in all things. All of the good works and virtues that the Lord commands of you, even in the Ten Commandments, everything you ought to practice, you know it. It's all lay, laid out before you. But now, as we approach the Lenten fast, Jesus' parable has for us both a warning and a great promise. Be warned, dear saints, as you set your hand to work in the vineyard. As you go out and labor to do all the good that a follower of Jesus ought to do, do not think you're doing God any favors. Don't think he needs your labors or that he owes you any thanks or rewards for them. And don't enter into these labors thinking that they'll get you any credit 
or that it makes you any better or holier or more righteous than your fellow workers in Christ's vineyard. It does not. When you've done all that you are commanded, Jesus teaches, say rather, we are but unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Even so, dear saints, take heart. Because in this parable, there is also the promise of the sweetest grace and mercy of God's unfathomable goodness and generosity. There will indeed be a reward for your labors. And here in this vineyard, you will receive from your Lord's hand heavenly treasures, a hundredfold reward, even eternal life. He gives to you as your wages a reward which you have in no way deserved. You struggle along in this life and in this world laboring to flee from sin, to do the good commanded of you. Your steps may falter, your flesh may fail, and yet, out of his otherworldly goodness, from the giving up of his own life upon the cross, you still receive the same gift. He gives to you exactly what he's always desired to give to you, what he has promised to give to you, whether you deserve it or not. Even if you grow tired under the burden and heat of the day, even if you fail to accomplish the labor set before you, yet still in this kingdom, in his vineyard, you will receive the very same reward. Every one of you gets one whole single Jesus. He is your heavenly treasure. He is your great reward. In him you have the pleasure and the goodwill of God himself smiling upon you. In him, through his cross, Born the pain and the burden and the suffering for you, your sins are indeed forgiven. And whatever you've lost or been suffered in this life, all at last will be repaid and made whole. In him you receive a hundredfold for your labors, and in him you have and will have eternal life. All this he gives to you freely. You haven't earned it. He simply loved to give out his heavenly treasures. Even now then, he calls you out of the idleness of the world. Come, he says. Come into the Lord's vineyard and here at last taste and see and experience the true goodness of the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.